you will never again be able to say that you haven't heard the term explained, beatific vision. The joy of heaven is not the streets of gold. Uh, it's not being without pain or suffering. It's not even seeing those whom we love who've gone to heaven before us, those who are in the Lord. The joy, the joy is in seeing Christ. My interest in Mormonism, or as they prefer now, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I will, for our purposes, use Mormon or LDS. But my interest arose because pre-crisis, uh, I began to develop a friendship and a discussion with someone uh, who is a devoted Mormon. So when an article crossed my desk about that, it caught my attention. And the writer was giving his reasons. I agree that you, if you're a Mormon and you believe what the Mormon church teaches, you do not have eternal life, you cannot be saved, you won't have heaven. Uh, one of the par portions, though, of that article was in the form of a question, and it was headed this way, Jesus, a means to an end? This is what he said, and I'll, I'll read it. A couple of years ago, I joined hundreds of other Christians in Manty, Utah, where for decades, the LDS Church produced the Mormon Miracle Pageant for two weeks every summer, a, a play depicting the events of the Book of Mormon, as well as the story of Joseph Smith and the beginnings of the LDS Church. For tens of thousands of Mormons on the hillside of the Manti Temple, you know, it's last year was the final year, he said, we Christians were there outside the grounds to talk to Mormons who were waiting for the pageant to begin, and the conversations I had were eye-opening. In the pageant, the stories of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon were woven around the story of a husband and wife in the 1800s, who, desiring to be together forever, something the LDS Church promises people, this couple joined the new church and make the trek out west with them to Utah. Then he says it was the ending of the pageant that stunned me. After the wife dies halfway through the play, everything leads up to the final climactic moment when the husband dies and joyfully goes to me, not his savior, but his wife. That was the reward he longed for, and that was the reward the LDS Church wanted to hold out to us, the audience, as the greatest thing they had to offer. Jesus was nowhere to be seen in this final moment of triumph. He said his mouth fell open, and that night he couldn't stop thinking about it. He thought of the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, 16, there in Athens, where Paul's spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. He says he was deeply disturbed by the unmistakably clear depiction of their theology. But even more distressing was these people who think they know Jesus but are placing their hope in something worth far less than the true Jesus. So in the days that followed, he began to ask Mormon people when he met them, what's your highest goal for eternity? And he said, without exception, that some form of to be with my spouse was their answer. He said that to him really explained the key difference between Mormons and Christians. And it was that for the Christian, Jesus is the end of Christianity. As one author put it, Christianity is Christ. But when he said that to people, he said the response of one man was, well, Jesus is the way we get to be with our spouse. And he said, I was dumbfounded and said, you mean he's a means to an end? And the man said, yes, he's the way. Well, we would agree he is the way, the truth, the life. No man gets to the Father but through him. But the goal is God himself. He's not merely the way. He's the goal. 
that is then the difference between, say, the Mormon who sees Jesus as just a brother, not someone we worship, a fellow spirit child of the Heavenly Father and Mother, someone who makes it possible for us to reach our goal? No, for the Christian, Jesus is the goal. Christianity is all about being united to him. That's not the case for Mormonism, as much as they might speak reverently about Jesus. So that means that anything, or the degree to which anything, clouds our eyes to hide Jesus, just to that degree that we fail to have the joy that God intends for us. The joy of heaven is not the streets of gold. It's not the absence of pain. It's not even seeing the loved ones in Christ who've gone there before us. The joy is in seeing Christ, and nothing short of that will do. You know, that sort of longing <clears throat> for a face-to-face -face fellowship is something that uh, I experienced on a, another level recently with the return of Lydia home from school. Uh, she had been in Wisconsin, you know, because of the events, the situation. Uh, she needed to return home, and so she did. And she returned home to our basement for 14 days, quarantine. I mean, she was right there. Uh, she was downstairs. We were in regular contact with her by video, sometimes for hours at a time. She ate with us, propped up on an iPad in the middle of our dinner table. So she ate what we ate when we ate it, but she was downstairs. We were upstairs. We played games. She had her own set of dice there that we played a game with. And when it became her turn, we watched her. She would adjust the screen on the downstairs uh, iPad that uh, showed the dice as she rolled them. Then we would roll them upstairs, and she would see that. But we played the game. The part. She attended church with us, sitting on Mrs. Searle's lap. But Again, in an iPad with her face turned towards the screen. We could hear her move. We could hear her talk. We could even yell to her and she could yell back. She was just on the other side of the door. She was closer than even the six feet of distance between us, although the door would be between. We couldn't see her. But I still remember the time when I had to get into that room, and so I let her know, I have to come in there, Would make sure you're standing far back. And I opened the door, and there she was. I could see her in the flesh. Nothing between us but distance, but I could see actually her, not a picture of her, on an iPad. And it, it shocked me uh, how emotional an experience that was for me. I commented to numerous people how much it took me by surprise that the difference between having every kind of contact but actual physical presence it wasn't good enough. Nothing else satisfied. Nothing short of that will do. Well, a few days back around that same dinner table, someone remarked on a question that they had heard and being asked at one time, and that was, well, when you get to heaven, who do you want to see first? And there were some remarks about famous people, mostly biblical fig figures, if I remember correctly. A few emotional moments where our eyes clouded over with tears, moments of silence and sort of a gulping as we remembered loved ones who've gone before. But all of those had been preceded with this caveat. Well, after I see Jesus, I want to see. Now, I won't presume to impose my own wicked heart on my family, but it occurred to me later, I wonder how true that is. And my comment at the time was, well, we don't have any choice. He will be the first one we see because there's a few things he's going to need to deal with us about. Remember that verse we considered a couple of weeks back, it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. 
So we will see Jesus first, but is he really the one we long to see first of all? Or we do want to sort of get that out of the way? Is there a curiosity? Okay, I've seen him. Now I want to get on to see those other people or do those other things. Well, the answer to that question is the degree to which we truly understand Augustine's words, thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds rest in thee. You know, Jesus understands it. Some of his final words to his disciples before he died were these, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, here's the goal. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Let not your heart be troubled. Restlessness, modern psychological term, is anxiety. What the world needs now more than ever before is comfort. Um, freedom from anxiety. But the reason that the world doesn't have that, the reason why there is this anxiety and restlessness, this is they've sought for rest in all sorts of things other than the Lord Jesus Christ. But for our own sake and for the world around us that's desperately in need of comfort, May we come to see and pursue to know that the only one who can calm our fears and satisfy our soul is Jesus Christ. Let me end with another passage of scripture that reflects this. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively or a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What's that hope? Well, an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Oh, is it heaven? It goes on that we're kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Why is it that we have suffering now? Well, it's that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, that that faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Here it is. It's finally stated. This is the purpose for suffering. The goal for which we long is the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then it says this. This is to be us now who, having not seen, we don't see him, but ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. This is what we're longing for, looking for, to receive the end of our faith the salvation of our souls. What is it? It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's being with him. Well, let's end our worship today with the singing of a song that does indeed speak of that ultimate goal and joy that we have. It's a song that's entitled, Till We See Christ. Uh, before that, though, I will end my comments with this benediction. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. <laughs>